Hello, my name is Bob Boucher. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, having served in the USS LaSalle LPD-3 from 1963 to 1967. I'm a plank owner, an original crew member. I grew up in Collinsville, Connecticut, and we've lived here in Wallingford for over 40 years. On February 22nd, 2013, along with Cameron Carey, a naval officer and also a USS LaSalle plank owner, we visited Medal of Honor recipient Captain Thomas Hudner, Captain USN retired. We met with Captain Hudner as a courtesy to a former USS LaSalle crew member, Paul Barter of Indiana. Paul served in the LaSalle during 1979-1980. After his tour in the LaSalle, he transferred to the destroyer USS Jesse L. Brown. Paul told me the story of Thomas Hudner and Jesse L. Brown and how Lieutenant J.G. Thomas Hunter attempted to rescue his wingman, Ensign Jesse L. Brown, during the Korean War at the Chosen Reservoir while flying a recon mission for the U.S. Marines in December 1950. This story that I'm about to share with you about two young naval officers from very different backgrounds. Tom Hunter was born in August 1924. He grew up in Fall River, Mass. His father owned a chain of grocery stores. Life was good. There were four brothers, all went to Phillips Academy in Andover, Mass. Two went to Harvard, one went to Princeton, and Tom went to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Tom's classmates included Medal of Honor recipient, Admiral James Stockdale, who was a POW for seven and a half years at the infamous Hanoi Hilton. He received the Medal of Honor for his steadfast refusal to give in to his North Vietnamese captors. Another classmate was Admiral Stansfield Turner, a future CIA director. 14 of his classmates became U.S. Navy admirals. Jesse Leroy Brown was born in October 1926. He and his five siblings were raised by sharecroppers in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. His parents, although very poor, stressed to their children the importance about doing your absolute best in school when Jesse was six years old, his father took him to an air show. That did it for Jesse. Flying became his dream. Jesse was the top student of his high school class. It was there he met his future wife, Daisy. Jesse applied to Ohio State University. He was told by many people, why don't you go to an all-black college? It would be easier for everybody if he did that. Jesse wanted Ohio State University. His idol, Jesse Owens, went there. He needed money for OSU. He worked very hard. He worked as a janitor at unloading boxcars from 3 p.m. to midnight or later. He persevered. At OSU, he applied for their aviation program. He was denied repeatedly because of his color. In 1946, after graduating from OSU, he enlisted in the United States Navy. He tried several times and was finally admitted to the Naval Reserve Officer Training Program. In 1948, he trained for carrier-based aircraft. Sadly, he was a constant butt of racial slurs and insults by both enlisted and officers. While proudly wearing his uniform with gold wings on his chest at home, he was still told to get to the back of the bus. When Jesse graduated from the Naval Flight Training School Program, the commanding officer of the group refused to pin the wings on Jesse. He had his executive officer do it instead. Jesse Leroy Brown was history's first black naval aviator. He was assigned to the carrier USS Leyte in October 1950. The ship was ordered to the Korean Peninsula. Tom Hudner was alone in the aviator's ready room when Jesse entered, and he introduced himself. Ensign Brown was a more experienced pilot than Lieutenant J.G. Hunter. They shook hands and became true friends. Jesse was well liked and respected by all crew members as an aviator and section leader. Jesse flew 20 combat missions in his F-4 Corsair. On December 4, 1950, while his squadron was flying reconnaissance for the U.S. Marines at the Chosen Reservoir, he was shot down by small arms fire. Near the end of November 1950, 
We had soldiers and Marines on the ground who were driving up in the vicinity of the Chosen Reservoir, headed on up towards the Yellow River, which is the dividing line between Manchuria and North Korea. Chinese were pouring across the Yellow River in great numbers and were attacking our troops and surrounding them, and they needed help desperately. We were flying above the mountains. The map showed the terrain in this area would be as high as 6,000 feet. The flight was going on with um, uh, nothing unusual. When Jesse called out that he was losing power, couldn't maintain altitude, and he thought he was going to have to crash land his airplane. When the plane hit the ground, it was bent at the cockpit at about a 30 degree angle, and the engine was torn off the airplane. But then we saw that the canopy of the aircraft had opened. Jesse had opened the canopy of the airplane and waved to us to let us know that he had survived. But he didn't get out of the airplane. And then we saw that smoke was coming out from under the cowling of the airplane, indicating there was some sort of fire. Dick Savoli came back on our frequency and said that a helicopter was on the way up, but it might be half an hour before it could get up there. And when I realized that Jesse's airplane may burst into flame before it could get there, I made a decision to uh, make a, a wheels-up landing, crash close enough to his airplane, and pull him out of the cockpit and wait for the helicopter to come. The snow was about a foot and a half deep, and I, when I got over to Jesse's airplane, I could see that he was, uh, the reason he hadn't gotten out of the aircraft was because as the fuselage had buckled, it had pinned his knee in the plane. And on the Corsair, there isn't a horizontal surface in the whole airplane. The wings come down from the fuselage and then go up to about six feet out from the fuselage. So getting up to look into the cockpit was difficult. I had to hold on with one hand just to hold on to the cockpit. I scooped up a handful of snow and threw it up under the cowling trying to... I knew I wouldn't put the fire out if there was a fire, but at least to um, dampen anything that was in there. A standing order for naval aviators is never crash land an aircraft to attempt a rescue. Tom disregarded the standing order and crashed his Corsair near Jesse's plane at the base of a mountain. The last transmission was, I don't want my friend to die alone. Tom hurt his back. He burned his hands and his arms, scooping two feet of snow under Jesse's plane to put out the fire. The planes were approximately at a 35 degree angle at the mountain's base. Tom was unable to extricate Jesse's leg from the crash cockpit. And after about half an hour of this, a helicopter arrived on the scene. The pilot came over to help. The helicopter pilot, Charlie Ward, worked with Tom to try to free Jesse's pinned leg. But Charlie and I worked, worked for about 15 or 20 minutes, seeing that we, there was absolutely nothing we could do. The axe just bounced off the fuselage. It did no good at all. Jesse did say, if you guys have a knife, cut my leg off. They had nothing at all to do this. Helicopters in 1950 were unable to fly at night. It was getting dark. The temperatures at night ranged from 25 to 35 below zero. Charlie called me aside and he said that those helicopters were not equipped for flying at night and he couldn't stay, he had to go. And he gave me the choice of uh, staying with Jesse or going with him. It would have been suicide to have stayed. Jesse had been wavering in and out of consciousness. I wasn't sure when he was conscious and when he wasn't. The temperature was at least around zero and went as low as 35 degrees below zero at night. And um, I've, I made the decision to go with Charlie. I told Jesse we were going back to uh, get equipment. We couldn't, couldn't get him out of the airplane as it was. And I don't know if he, if he heard me, I don't know if he was alive at the time. Jesse was in and out of consciousness. Jesse called Tom over and told him, please tell Daisy how much I love her. He then put his head down. Tom felt these were Jesse's last words. The Chinese and North Korean troops were edging their way in. 
Tom was certain that when he returned to Carrier Leyte, he would be restrained and held for court-martial. Instead, the flight deck commanding officer shook hands with Tom. When I got back out to the ship, the captain called me the bridge right away, and he had the helicopter ready, the ship's flight surgeon, and he had a number of aircraft. He was going to take that carrier in as close to offshore as he possibly could, send the flight surgeon and the helicopter to the site of the wreckage, cut Jesse's body out of the airplane, and bring him back to the ship. And I told him it was a very humane, but only a symbolic gesture, because it was much, much too dangerous to do so. Later, a squadron of Corsairs flew out to Jesse and the wrecked planes, ceremoniously circled the chosen reservoir mountain, dropping bombs and napalm on both planes and Jesse's body. So there's a flight of uh, Corsairs with him with napalm, with the other aircraft flying escort and support for them. And they found our two airplanes and dropped napalm. And they destroyed his airplane and my airplane. So Jesse died a warrior's death in a funeral pyre. I think that in retrospect, it was almost a natural thing for guys, um, guys in combat to do for shipmates and comrades. Had I been on the ground, I think I would have had enough faith in my shipmates for somebody to do something. And I felt that, yes, there was a chance that I wouldn't, but to save Jesse's life was worth it. You know, I do feel very strongly about our doing this for freedom, but, you know, the bottom line is that freedom doesn't mean nearly as much as spending a lot of time with these guys, especially under times of stress and everything. The guys will do anything for one another. Looking back ever since I got the medal and, and seeing some of those people who are no longer with us, what they did, maybe there are ten times as many people who should have gotten the medal. Maybe it's only twice as much. I don't know. But by God, we're not the only people that earned it. All these guys have stories. The music may be different, but it's all the same story. The pilots oh, recited oh, the Lord's Prayer, and this Lord was heard through the speakers on the USS Lady. I personally spoke with a lady crew member who expressed he remembered hearing the prayer and that it was moving for everybody on the ship. Tom Hunter was one of 11 at the Chosen Reservoir who received the Medal of Honor. President Harry S. Truman presented the Medal of Honor to Tom Hunter on April 13, 1950. Tom's personal recollection of President Truman, President Truman was very down to earth. He was friendly to Tom and his family at both the Oval Office and the Rose Garden Ceremony. Tom continued to have great respect for Truman. Here's a few reasons why. When Truman left office, he backed up his car to the White House, loaded all his personal items and bests, and drove to Independence, Missouri with no entourage. When asked by some large corporations to become a board member, Truman told all of them, I didn't become president to make money. How things have changed. A favorite Truman quote about Washington is, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. After the Medal of Honor ceremonies, Tom returned to Concord, Mass. The town declared Thomas Hunter Day. They bestowed honors and gifts to Tom, including a $1,000 check, which he immediately endorsed and sent to Daisy Crown in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Tom also helped pay for Daisy's education at the University of Mississippi. Jesse Brown inspired many black Americans to pursue flying. One such person being seaman apprentice Frank E. Peterson. Peterson would become the first black United States Marine Corps aviator, the first black American United States Marine Corps general. He retired after 38 years of service as a lieutenant general. Tom had various assignments in his naval career, such as flight instructor, flying experimental aircraft, including jets, flying with the United States Air Force, and became executive officer of the USS Kitty Hawk off the coast of Vietnam. Tom never flew combat missions in the Vietnam War. In 1972, the Navy commissioned the USS Jesse L. Brown, fast frigate 1089. Tom and Daisy attended. 
As a speaker at the ceremony, Tom said, Jesse died in the, in the wreckage of his airplane with courage and unfathomable dignity. He willingly gave his life to tear down barriers for, for the freedom of others. Captain Thomas Hunter retired from the Navy in 1973. He was a commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Veterans Services from 1991 to 1999. He was active in many military veterans programs. Currently, a guided missile destroyer, the USS Thomas Hunter DDG-116, is being built at the Bath Iron Works in Maine. They are trying for a commissioning date of August 31st 2018, Tom's 94th birthday. An excellent book, The Flight of Jesse Leroy Brown by Theodore Taylor, was highly endorsed by Daisy Brown Thorne and Jesse Brothers. A more recent book, Devotion by Adam Magos, is also compelling. For more information, search for Hunter or Jesse Brown on YouTube. Thank you.